Eric, we're going to enjoy ourselves and about the rest of them. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome. I'm trying to compete with the baby, but uh, I'm over here, folks. Better looking than the baby, okay? Much more cuddly if you want to find out afterward. No, we better not go there. Good. Good. One or two more just coming in. Great stuff. I can hear music for some reason, Dave, but uh, we'll move on to the first slide and hopefully we'll be okay. Good. We're here to uh, worship together and I've chosen two songs, My Jesus, My Saviour, and then there's a lovely little follow-on, uh, Jesus shall take the highest honour. So let's stand, let's link our hearts together in, in our hearts together in prayer. No, our voices together in song. It's going to be one of those spoonerisms this morning, isn't it? Good. Let's stand and sing. So remain standing and we're going to sing this one. Jesus shall take the highest down. I love that first song, My Jesus. Makes a big difference, doesn't it? If I said, oh look, there's a £20 note down there, you'd all be interested. But if I said, oh there's my £20 note, you're all excluded, it's mine. It must be mine, it's got the Queen on it. So if you see any £20 notes, you hand them in afterwards, okay? I'll look after them for you. But that little pronoun, my, makes all the difference. And when we know him as our Lord and Saviour, we give him the honour he deserves. Jesus shall take the highest honour.
It's an old one, but one we haven't sang for a long time, so we got the tune. Let's go for it. Please be seated. Good. Let's uh, link our hearts together in prayer. Just thinking of some of the many names that were said in those two choruses alone. I think there's uh, about 180, some say over 200 different names and titles given to Jesus in the Bible. But perhaps the best one of all is the simple name Jesus, Saviour, Rescuer. Let's pray. Lord, we're only here this morning because Christ took upon himself a body entered our world and took upon himself a name we know as the eternal word he had many names and titles but he chose or you chose a specific name for him to bear when he entered our world that angelic messenger said to Mary you are to give him the name Jesus and then explain why for he will save his people from their sins and Lord we're here this morning because he fulfilled the meaning of his name he alone is the one who bore away our sins in his body on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that he rose again, declaring himself to be the son of the living God. And that is why we worship him and we honour him and we acknowledge him this morning. Thank you, there is nobody like our Jesus, the one who has always existed, the word who was with God, the word who is God, and the word who was God. Thank you for the eternal nature the part of the Godhead. Lord, we thank you that he is indeed not just the, the eternal word, but he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And we know that one day on earth, people will worship him as the angelic hosts worship him in heaven. Thank you that he is the Christ, the chosen one, the anointed one, the one who is marked out, the one who is unique in every way. And Lord, we want to bring our praise and our honour and our worship to him. Thank you, Lord, that we uh, look up and that helps us to cope with the world in which we live because when we look down and we look around, our hearts are so often broken or depressed. We think again of Russia and Ukraine and this whole situation which can so easily escalate. We think of those people, even last night, who were bombed in their own city, in their own homes. And Lord, we ask that again, this evil situation will get resolved soon. We pray for Putin, Lord, humble his heart, we ask. Um, Help him to see common sense. May those who advise him have courage to uh, speak honestly. And Lord, we ask for peace to come to that part of the world again. And not just there, we think of Israel and Palestine and even the ongoing problems there. We pray again for the peace of Jerusalem. And we pray again, Lord, for Jew and Palestinian, that somehow there might be a measure of stability again in that part of the world. And Lord, that's just one of many trouble spots that come to mind. Uh, We think of those living in refugee camps, those who are affected by civil war and having to leave their countries. The ongoing problems of Syria and Somalia. Lord, politicians seem to have an impossible job and they can't handle it on their own, but we pray. Give them wisdom and give them a, a compassionate heart to want to deal with these situations. Uh, for the, thank you, Lord, for the many charity and aid organisations meeting needs of individuals this morning. And we pray again for the work of groups like Tear Fund as they seek to bring practical help, continue to finance their ministry, continue to protect their workers 
and we ask that the aid that they take out to these uh, trouble spots will go to those who need it the most. Lord, we want to pray for each other. Lord, we all have our own problems, things that dominate our lives. You know that which is weighing heavy on our hearts this morning, whether ourselves or our loved ones. And we just pause and reflect and commit our loved ones to you and these situations. Lord, please, in your goodness, in your mercy, hear our prayers and petitions. And now receive our thanksgiving as we bring it all to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just two notices. Uh, on the notice board there is a little poster and a sign-up list because we're going to have a day in the country. Okay, so um, I can't remember the day. Is it June the 3rd? It's on the poster. Have a look afterwards. It was on the notices. But it is a Saturday. And if you're able to make it, we're up at Lockerley Water Farm. If you don't know where that is, see Dave or myself or someone afterwards and we can point it out. And it's arrive at 10 and leave about 4. Bring your own food. It's a beautiful place. You can just sit and enjoy the countryside or we'll play games together, all sorts of things. Um, Self-entertainment will be going on. It's a great site. If you can make it, pop that date in your diary and uh, you're welcome and then thank you for the prayers for the work that Penny and myself are involved in uh, our own newsletter is out I sent an electric an email version out but if you want a paper copy there's some at the back on the table if you can pray for key to life we've got this exhibition coming to three schools St John's Parkgate and then Marchwood Primary School but all three schools want me to put it on grass or half on grass or drive over grass to get to the concrete and it is a heavy truck and those fields have been very, very wet. And I don't think we can do that. And so I have arranged a second option with the school that they're not too keen on, but I think we'll end up there. But just pray for the logistics of Key to Life because when it happens, it will be a, a fantastic resource. The kids will love it. The teachers will love it. They'll have a 45-minute lesson on the life of Jesus. But we've just got to make sure we can get it in the school at the right place. So that's my big prayer concern. The key to life in June in St. John's School, in Parkgate School and in Marchwood School. So keep praying. Now, oh yeah, kids. As you know, at our all age service, we like to do something for all ages. And uh, we try and tie it into our passage. And our passage this week and the next two weeks is an interesting one, as you will see when we read it later on. But uh, I've pulled out one theme that I want to share with the kids. And uh, I thought, uh, do you know what? Some people... Have pets. Can you be Boaz, can you believe some people have dogs as pets? Can you believe that? You've got a dog, haven't you? And what's he called? Lily? Your dog's called Lily. That's my mum's name. My mum was called Lily. Have you got a dog? Tammy. Have you got a dog? Tammy. Up in Birmingham, yeah? Anyone else got a dog here? All right, you may be good. <laughs> Anyone would like a dog? <laughs> All the parents holding their kids' arms down saying you're not having one. Thank you, Joe. Good. I thought we'd have a little quiz, actually, uh, just to make my point, because dogs are called man's best friend. Now, man there doesn't just mean male. Mankind's best friend is often a dog. And we'll find out why at the end of this little trivia quiz. So, first of all, don't shout out because I want the 12 and unders to do this. Can any of the young folks, those who go to Explorers, tell me what type of dog this is? Anyone know what type of dog this is? I thought this was an easy one. Yep. Not a husky. A Boaz. It's a Labrador. A Labrador Retriever. Okay, and these dogs are uh, all over the world, very, very popular, one of the most popular dogs in the world, but they didn't come to the UK until the 1800s. And this is just a bit of trivia for everyone. When did they arrive, or where did they come from in the UK? Did we import them in from Canada or from Denmark? Canada or Denmark? Do me hands up. Who's going for Canada? Anyone? Who's going for Denmark? Canada is where they came from. North America is where we, we, we got the, the Labrador Retriever from. How about this dog? Anyone know what this dog is called? It has many little names. Yep. Sausage Dog is one of its names. Anyone know another name for it? A hot dog. It's, 
They're often called, in America, they're often called wieners, which is a hot dog. Not a poodle. Good try. Joe. A, a, yeah, you've got it. A, da, a, a Dutch hound. A Dutch hound. And it's got another name called a doxy. A doxy. Uh, they've got short legs because the, the, their noses are close to the ground and slim bodies so they could go down holes and hunt out um, their, their prey. But they come in different sizes. Did you know that? I wonder how many sizes you can get a hot dog in. Two, four, or six. Those are your choices. Anyone going for two sizes? Anyone going for four sizes? Anyone going for six sizes? Actually, they come in two sizes. Two. You get them at average £35 or an £11 miniature. So there you go. Here we go. Anyone know what this one's called? Anyone who has another go? Oh, Joe. A German shepherd, a German shepherd. But what, what, what's the official name in English? Is it the German shepherd or is it the Alsatian? Okay, that's your choice. Who's going for the, the German shepherd as its official name? Who's going for the Alsatian? Eh, eh. The official name in the UK is the German shepherd. And of course, very popular as police dogs and security dogs. How about this good looking beast? Would you walk down the street with that? I certainly wouldn't, that's for sure. Um, Ruben, what's this called? No, I thought you were going to get it from earlier. What did you say earlier? Poodle, you got it. That is a poodle, okay, in all its glory. But where do we get poodles from? Germany or France? Germany or France? Who's going for Germany? Who's going for France? Actually, they're from Germany, not France. Most people assume they're French, but they're not. They're from Germany. Okay, a couple more to go. Oh, look at this good-looking beast. Do you know what we call this one? Naomi. It's a Yorkshire Terrier. Okay, but actually, originally, it had a different name. Was it a Welsh Terrier or a Scotch Terrier? A Welsh Terrier or a Scotch Terrier? Who's going for the Welsh version? Who's going for the Scotch? Scotch is correct. Well done. They originally called Scotch Terriers and the Yorkshire folk nicked them, I guess. <laughs> okay, two more to go. What about this good-looking beast? Anyone know what it is? Abby. A beagle. A beagle. Beagles have a great sense of what? Is it hearing or smell? Hearing or smell? Hold on, Mo. Who's going for hearing? Who's going for smell? You're quite correct, of course. And that's why they're used in hunting. Now I did all of that to get to this good looking beast. Now it's a terrier, but it's not a Welsh terrier or a Scottish terrier or a Yorkshire terrier. Anyone know what type of terrier it is? A scruffy. <laughs> it is a sky, S-K-Y, a sky terrier because it comes from the Isle of Skye up there in Scotland and they were very popular in the Victorian area. area era. In fact, lots of Victorians had them, but sadly in 2012, there were only 42 registered left alive. But they've been breeding them, so they've built up their numbers again. But 160 years ago, when Derek was just a boy, 160 years ago, John Gray owned a Sky Terrier. And he was a night watchman, so when he went out on security at night, making sure uh, whatever he was guarding was safe, he had this dog with him. And as you can see, it would scare anyone off, wouldn't it? I mean, if you were a great big burglar with, with you know, a, a stick in your hand, you'd run a mile as soon as you saw that little thing. Now, 160 years ago, policemen weren't called policemen. Well, they were, but they had a nickname. Do any of the children know what we used to call policemen? The, what do you reckon? Timmy. Not Timmy's. <laughs> Yeah, but they had a certain name. Peter. Cops, good guess. Penny. Bobby. They were called Bobbies, because the person who started the police force was called Sir Robert Peel. And Roberts are often called Bobs or Bobbies. And so because he founded the police organisation, coppers were called, or policemen were called, Bobbies. And so he called his dog Bobby. Now John, John Gray sadly became ill and he died. And they buried him in Greyfriars Cemetery in Edinburgh. But every night, Bobby went missing. 
and they couldn't find him. They searched upstairs, downstairs, in their ladies', ladies chamber, wherever they could. And every morning, they found him lying on the gravestone of his master. Now, dogs weren't allowed in graveyards, but every morning, not for one year or two, for 14 years until he died, Bobby was found lying, sleeping on the gravestone of his master, John Gray. And if you go to that grave, uh, that Edinburgh today, and Greyfire Cemetery, there's a water fountain with a little picture of Bobby on it. And there's a picture of his gravestone right next to his master. So there's a, fan, oh, a drinking fountain and a, and a memory. To remember what? That John Gray had a dog. No, no, no. To remember that John Gray had a faithful dog who not only served him in life, but every night would go and sleep next to his master. Because a man's best friend is his dog. And the theme of that little story is faithfulness. Faithfulness. The two were together. John Gray only had one dog. And Bobby only wanted one master. And he missed him when he passed on. And you know, we could be faithful. We could be faithful friends, can't we? A good friend sticks closer than a brother, the Bible says. And as husbands and wives, we're called to be faithful to our partners. Not to look for a new version now and again, but to stay with the one God has given us. And that's our theme this morning from Proverbs chapter 5. Good. Um, that's me out of the way. Abby, you're going to come and uh, explain what's happening with Operation. Do you want the zap or do you want me to zap? I'll leave it there. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Abby. So I'm the coordinator for the shoe boxes put in together for Operation Christmas Child. Um, and I'm going to let you know how we've been getting on this month. So, so far this year, we've been collecting hats, scarves, gloves in January. And we collected cuddly toys in February and in March we were collecting flannels, <coughs> soap and sponges and in April we were collecting combs, hairbrushes and toothbrushes so I'm going to let you have, know how we got on with that so how, does anyone want to guess how many hairbrushes they think we collected? 83 anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> we collected 16 hairbrushes oh, is that all? And, and combs yep. <laughs> 107. So we did collect 108 combs we also collected toothbrushes. <laughs> we collected 78 toothbrushes. So that's a good number collected. And I'm happy to say we did not collect any toothpaste, which is one of the things we can't send. So thank you all for your contributions. So this month, it's more exciting. We're collecting boys' toys. So... We have a list of thing, uh, suggestions, but it does, this isn't all the stuff you can get. So we, have, we can get things like cars, toy cars, um, Play-Doh for the younger children, or small games, as long as they will fit in a shoebox. So don't get like really big boxes, but small like travel games are fine. Uh, little jigsaws, Lego blocks sort of thing so anything there there will be flyers to give you suggestions but again you can if you've got any things if you want to know if they're suitable you can just come and talk to me afterwards and there are a few things we can't send and uh, we cannot send toy soldiers or anything that's war related because some of these boxes will be going to children who are ukraine perhaps so that wouldn't be a good idea and um, water pistols again because they could look like a weapon they won't be allowed or police sets, again, so. And also books with lots of words because they may not read English, so picture books for younger ones is fine, but not lots of story books. 
Um, so we got a little quiz. Can anyone tell me whether we're allowed to send Play-Doh? Anyone else? Yes, yes, we can send Play-Doh. What about toy soldiers? No. <laughs> no, we can't send them. Um, footballs. If they've got a pump. Yeah. Yes, we can send footballs. Obviously not pumped up ones because they won't fit, but deflated ones for the older boys are fine. What about little animals? Yes. Yes, we can send them. Uh, water pistols? No. No, we can't send them. So... This is what we're collecting. There will be flyers, and the green box will be in the foyer again for you to put things in. So I hope you have fun collecting these boys' items. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Good. Let's uh, worship the Lord again, shall we? Let's sing a couple of songs, and then look one to go to Explorers, and we'll read the scriptures together. So give thanks to our God and King, and then Faithful One will sing those two together and no doubt you've pulled out the theme of many of these songs. Give thanks to our Lord, and God, our Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. Let's stand to sing. Good to, I think, did I see Sabrina here earlier? Oh, that's good, because I think it's one of Sabrina's favourite, that one, isn't it? So good timing to have that one with a visit of Sabrina. Great to see you back, Sabrina. Let's sing Faithful One, So Unchanging. And uh, we'll sing it through twice, if that's okay.
Please be seated and explorers, you're off to explore. We'll see you later. We can do our Bible reading. I don't know if I've got a volunteer to just say your verses into the mic so that we pick it up on the tape. Stu, can I pick on you? Thank you. And then uh, the folks who watch online will get both parts of it. We're in Proverbs chapter 5, it's an interesting chapter, as are the next two, and uh, you'll pick up the theme as we read it through together. So if I read a verse and you read a verse, my son, pay attention to my wisdom, turn your ear to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Lest you lose your honour to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house of another. At the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hated discipline. How my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors. And I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. Drink water from your own system, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sins hold them fast. For lack of discipline, they will, they will die, led astray by their own great folly. Thank you. Let's pray for ourselves and the little ones, and then uh, we'll look at this passage. Lord, your word often um, deals with difficult issues. Sometimes it's quite deep and complicated. Other times it's straightforward. And like a hammer, sometimes it kind of bashes us. Uh, sometimes it hits us between the eyes. Lord, we thank you that your word is relevant and it speaks into our times. It speaks into our lives, our situations, our culture. And as we look at this, uh, what we would perhaps term a tricky subject today in the next couple of weeks, Lord, help us to learn from it. Help us to be wise and to, to be able to heed its warnings. And we pray for the little ones, especially upstairs. It's a tricky one for their teachers, but Lord, help those who are teaching. 
and bless these kids to learn something from today's passage, we pray. And for ourselves, Lord, give us insight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Warnings against adultery. Warnings against adultery is really the theme of this poetic chapter, Proverbs 5, 1 to 23. The Ten Commandments were given uh, to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. And they were given primarily for Jewish people to follow. It was a covenant, a sacred agreement between God and his people. Now, the principles of those Ten Commandments apply to all people, if they are wise. But they were originally given to one group of people. Now, we know there are Ten Commandments. We know they were given to Moses. We know where they were given on Mount Sinai. But here's a bit of trivia for you. How many times did God have to give the Ten Commandments? How many times did God have to give the Ten Commandments? What do you reckon, Abby? Twice. Not twice. He had to give them three times. The first time in Exodus 20 were verbal. God spoke them to Moses. They weren't written down at that point. Then, in Exodus 31, God wrote them with his own finger. But when Moses came down from the mountain, the people were worshipping a golden calf, and in his anger, he smashes them. And then a third time, Exodus 34, God again gives Moses those Ten Commandments on stone. Now here's a, I'm not going to actually do it publicly because it's one of those questions, a bit like, can you name the 12 disciples? And can you get them in order? I wonder if you could name the Ten Commandments off by heart, one by one. I'm not going to ask you to do it. The Ten Commandments actually divide into two parts, not four and, sorry, not five and five, as we often see them depicted on the tablets. The Ten Commandments divide into four and into six. The fir- and they're to do with relationships. The first four is our relationship with God. And then the bottom six, the remaining six, are our relationship to other people. And that's why when Jesus summarised the Ten Commandments, he could say it's simple. Love God with all your heart and then love your neighbour as yourself. Respect for God, respect for your neighbour. Because that's how the Ten Commandments divide up and work out. And when it comes to respecting our neighbour, those bottom six commandments, it is all about respect. Honour your father and mother, respect your parents. You shall not murder, respect life. You shall not commit adultery, respect your partner. You shall not steal, respect other people's property. You shall not bear false witness, respect the truth. And you shall not, shall not covet, respect what you have, instead of thinking about what you haven't got and what you would like. So it's all about respect. And commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery, is our theme this morning and over the next two weeks. It is so important that God included it in his top ten rules. That's how relevant and important this subject of adultery is. Now, what do we mean by adultery? The dictionary defines it this way, voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and a person who is not their partner, their spouse. So it's when a man goes and sleeps with another woman who's not his wife, or a woman goes and sleeps with someone else who's not his husband. And that's how the Bible defines adultery as well. Leviticus 18.20, do not have sexual relations with your neighbour's wife and defile yourself with her. And if we go back to the beginning, God made one man, one woman. And Jesus reiterated, that is marriage in God's eyes. Faithfulness between a man and a woman. And adultery is wrong for a number of reasons. First, because it involves breaking the most sacred promise we make to one another. That we will be faithful to them in marriage. And even non-Christians who aren't interested in God or religion, they know that if their partner sleeps around, that relationship is doomed. It ruins it because we were created one for one. Secondly, adultery weakens the institutions of marriage and family. Someone has said nobody sins in a vacuum, meaning that our actions affect others. 
And I've seen so many families break up. And the victims are the innocent partner and the children when adultery takes place. And then thirdly, when people put the well-being of their marriage above their personal happiness, and today we're told that it's all about you and your personal happiness that counts, the Bible says, no, it's not. When we put the well-being of our marriage above personal happiness, according to the experts, you achieve more lasting happiness in the long run. For example, Michael W. Austin, PhD, uh, one of the uh, professor of philosophy, says this. There will be times when you sacrifice your own happiness for the sake of your spouse and for the relationship itself. However, when we put the interest of our spouse and the well-being of marriage, our marriage relationship above our own pursuit of happy, happiness, paradoxically, we experience a deeper and more lasting form of happiness. This is the form of happiness that comes from having good character and an enduring love relationship with the person we vowed to be faithful to till death us do part. Now, let me just pause. If you think this is not a relevant subject for us today, think again. We've got a new king, King Charles, Charles III, who in 1994 on the television admitted to killing, committing adultery during his marriage to Prince Diana. So our monarch, our figure that we look up to, admits he's an adulterer. Our former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, resigned and the Telegraph had the headline, Goodbye to the Amoral Serial Adulterer. These are the leaders of our nation. And not just Boris in his cabinet, but Matt Hancock and others were also, when we were all isolated in COVID, having adulterous affairs with other people. The leaders of our nation. No wonder we were in the mess we're in. Righteousness uplifts the nation. Sin is a reproach to any nation. And you know, many preachers, vicars, ministers get found out from this very sin. Not just the TV American evangelists. You might be shocked to know that within, there are 12 churches in the western wards, our area. And several ministers have resigned over adultery. I'm not going to say who they are. And if you guess, you'll probably guess wrong. But it's happening on our own doorstep. Or it has, anyway. And in a small church, when adultery happens with the leadership, it is very hard for a small church to recover. From my experience, as I've observed, churches affected by it. And in our own family situations, and I'm not just talking about husband, or, I'm thinking of, you know, people, brothers, sisters, cousins, etc. We probably all know someone who's left a partner for someone else and had an adulterous affair. So it's very relevant it scratches where we itch, and that's why God made number seven commandment, do not commit adultery, because it affects society, it affects the family, it has a devastating effect on the individual. Let's uh, look at the passage, and I'm going to pull out different threads. Here's the first one that Solomon says in great poetic language. And the principle is this, that if we have an involvement, if we have an experience with another person who's not our partner, it goes from sweetness to bitterness. From sweetness to bitterness. Verse 1. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight. It could easily be a mother talking to her daughter. But it was written by a man, so you get the man's perspective. But this is a principle, male or female. Son or daughter needs to take on board. Verse 2. Maintain discretion. And your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous man or woman drip honey, and their speech is smoother than oil. But in the, in the end, she or he is a bitter, as bitter as gall, sharp as a double edged sword. Her feet or his feet go down to death. His or her steps lead straight to the grave. He or she gives no thought of the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly. And he or she does not know it. Do you know, I uh, like a mince pie. You can probably tell by my figure, a mince pie with ice cream is never refused when offered. And at Christmas time, hey, I'm in heaven because wherever I go, I do carol service, coffee mornings, school assembly, wherever I go at Christmas, out come the mince pies. Would you like one, Mr. Curley? Oh, no, no, no. go on. Oh, go on, and if you insist. 
So you take on board a mince pie and normally they are good. But sometimes they're not as good as they look. You know, they're so tempting, they're so delicious. You pick one up, you have a bite, only to discover that the, the, the pastry is crumbly, the filling is stodgy, and the taste is bland or... Bleh. And then you're stuck. You've got a mouthful, and you've got three quarters of a mince pie, and there's no plant pot you can put it in. And I've been honest, I've often had to wrap it in a serviette and shove it in my pocket, and then, ugh, it's not a pretty sight. It promises so much. And the disappointment when it's a bad one. Now, if it's true of a mince pie, it's true of other things in life. So many things promise sweetness, but they bring bitterness. They promise good things, but they end up with disappointment. The father says to his son, adultery is like that. It promises sweetness, the excitement of an affair. Put wow back into your life. Sexual pleasure. Wow, you're going to enjoy this. It's going to be good. And no one need know. You can get away with it. Verse 6 says, it promises honey. Verse 7, but in the end it brings gall. That's uh, made from a plant, wormwood or myth. It's bitter tasting, bitter tasting. And the father's point is simple. It starts out well, starts out fun, starts out exciting. It ends up with sadness and regret. According to the expert, for example, very well, wellmind.com, most affairs, that is acts of adultery, only last between six months and a year. That's the majority. Now, I know cases where people have left a partner and it's gone on for the rest of their lives. But normally, according to the experts, six months to a year is the normal length of time an affair lasts. The book of Proverbs, again and again and again, says look at the big picture. Look at the end, not just the beginning. Verse 11. At the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You know, only an idiot would go to the train station or the airport and buy a ticket without knowing where it's gonna, they're going to end up. You know, unless you've got lots of money and lots of time and a spirit of adventure, nobody just turns up at the railway station and says, what can I get for 50 quid? And gets on the train and ends up... No. You want to know where you're going to end up. Where's the end of the journey? And that's the point that Solomon is making to his son. It might seem exciting at the beginning, but look where you're going to end up. It promises sweetness, it delivers bitterness. Secondly, he talks about an involvement... An encounter goes from gain to loss. Gain to loss. Verse 7. Now then, my son, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from him or her. Do not go near the door of his or her house, lest you lose your honour to others and your dignity to the one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enriches the house of another. At the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hated discipline. How my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to their instructors. And I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. Now, I know this is a heavy topic, so I'm going to try and make it a little bit lighter as we go along and I'm going to show you a little video clip from one of the programs that me and Penny enjoy watching on telly. Again it's not a perfect program, occasionally it has bad language or a little bit rudeness and you can fast forward it and if you've got sensitive ears then don't watch it. But it's a great program because it focuses on some fantastic countryside and uh, there's two comedians, Paul Whitehouse and Bob Mortimer and Paul Whitehouse is the experienced fisherman and he's teaching Bob Mortimer how to fish. But have a look at this little clip. Come on, Simon. Come on. So where'd you reckon the fish are, Bob? In the river. Get to it. Yes! 
that. I mean, Bob, this is the salmon. Whoa! -ho. Come on, Bob. Come on, come on, come on, come on, oh, come on. Right. It's good fish. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> we'll get him on the bank, yes. What do I do, Paul? Take the rod. Mm -hmm. right. When it starts to run, you just let go of that just rail. Let go. Right, okay, keep winding. Keep that rod bent like that. Keep winding. Keep winding. Oh, I can right. fit something's okay, clicking, okay. click, click. All right, okay, okay, okay. Don't wind. He wants to get, he wants out of here. Yeah. Don't wind, don't wind. Oh, oh look at the size of him. Look Let's at the go. size of him. Don't wind. <laughs> oh, oh, he didn't like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. Okay, that's it, go on, keep, that's it, keep pressure on. That's it, yeah. Oh, ho, 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 Look at that! Whoa! Oh, look at him, Paul, man. Wow! Wait, are you holding her head there like that? Wow. There you go. Are you Aren't okay? She's beautiful. She's okay. We'll get her back now. She'll be yeah. fine, won't she? There she goes. See ya. And away. Well done, Bob. It's a, it's a lovely program. The, the scenery is stunning. And the conversation is just two friends who, who, who have a, a chat. But I'll show you that clip because that's how temptation works. And especially when it comes to something like adultery. First, it's like fishing. The bait is dropped. No one goes fishing without any bait on their hook. If you do, you're just going to stand in the water or on the riverbank for a long time. You need bait. The bait is dropped. Second, the salmon or the fish looks at the bait and thinks, I fancy that. I fancy that. But instead of thinking, oh, there could be a hook behind it and swimming off, it goes closer and it maybe nudges it. So you've got to be patient. You wait for the bite and then you snap. And it's too late. The bait is dropped. Our inner desire is attracted to the bait. Sin occurs when we give in, when we bite. And then fourthly, sin results in tragic consequences because you're caught. And then like those two gentlemen, so often they don't throw you back in. They eat you. That's how temptation and sin works. Just like fishing. Just like fishing. And look at some of the saddest verses in this chapter, verses 9 to 14. With hindsight, the adulterous man is just chewing over the cost of his actions. And he's discovered the most expensive thing in the world? Sin. And sin is always twofold. It's when we say no to God... Wrong attitude, and that always leads to wrong actions. If we say yes to God, it often leads to right, it should lead to right actions. Verse 9, what happens? He's lost his reputation, a good reputation. He or she are the gossip of town. Instead of saying, look at so-and-so, I'd love to be like that person. What a godly person. Now it's, did you hear about so-and-so? I know, who'd have thought it? Who'd have believed it? They went to church as well, you know. A good reputation flushed down the drain. Verse 10, he said, instead of riches, only poverty. It's like someone who's, who's blown it all on the stock market. It looked good and the shares plummeted and they're left bankrupt. And then verse 13, regret and reflection. He wished he'd listened to his father's instructions. If only, if only he could change it, but it's too late. I say this sensitively because I don't know all your situations, but I tell you this, if you have committed adultery, it is not the unpardonable sin. It is a sin God can forgive and does forgive. When we come humbly, when we come repentantly, if we confess our sins, even the sin of adultery, God is faithful. We might not be, but God is. And God is just and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we may have to live with the consequences. It's like if I go out and get drunk and drive, I, I, I may crash my car as a drunk driver, 
Now, I can find forgiveness from that sin, but my car will still be crashed, my reputation will still be tarnished, and I may face prosecution in jail for my actions. So you live with the consequences, although the original sin can be forgiven. And when it comes to adultery, God can forgive, but you may lose your family or even friends as a result of it. Gain to loss. Here's the third thing. Purity to pollution. Purity to pollution. Look at verse 15. Drink water from your own system. Running water from your own well. Should your spring overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? From purity to pollution. Don't you, don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but one in every four people in the world in which we live drink every day contaminated water according to the United Nations. They estimate that some 1.8 billion people around the globe drink water that is contaminated with faeces, faecal matter, poop. And Solomon compares enjoying marriage, love to drink in pure water, and adulterous love to drink in polluted water. Sex within marriage is good. It's the way God designed it to be enjoyed. But an adulterous affair is bad and to be avoided. I don't think it's a coincidence that the very first miracle Jesus did was at a wedding where he turned water into wine. I wonder if he was given an object lesson concerning the delights of marriage that when two come together, hey, they find something that even better than water, wine to celebrate and to rejoice. Here's the fourth and the final illustration he uses. An involvement and experience goes from freedom to bondage. Freedom to bondage. Look at verse 21. For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your path. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sin hold them fast. For lack of discipline, they will die, led astray by their own great folly. Let me show you another little video clip of one of the, the greatest creatures on the planet. Help, 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 help. Here we go. Wow. Look at this. <laughs> Beautiful. Whales are pretty impressive, aren't they? Fantastic. Fantastic. But if a whale gets beached, their strength, their freedom, their beauty, all that they can do in the open water is taken away from them. They're just a lump of blubber waiting to die. Unless, as occasionally happens, humans come along and somehow manage to get it back in the water. Beautiful creature designed for the opens. And when it's in that water, there's nothing that can match it in all its glory. But if it gets beached, a lump of blubber waiting to die. Hey, you were created. Some of you may remain single. That's a blessing from God. And if God calls you to be single, God will give you the strength to cope with that situation. But some of you will be called to find a partner. And when you find a partner and when you get married and you make those vows, you mean them. And it's like being a whale out in the water. You work on your marriage, and you have to work on it. You know, I've been married 26 years this May. If you say to Penny, have you ever thought of committing adultery? She'll probably say no. Murder often, but never adultery. 
You work at it. And my marriage is only here because I've got a good wife who works probably harder than I do to my shame. You have to work at it. But it's like being out in the ocean. There's nothing beats it. I, I, I was with my footballing mates driving a minibus not long ago and there was a guy in there who was not a Christian, far from it by his words and his attitude. And uh, I'd never met him, well I'd met him once or twice but I only say hi to him. And we got chatted and he just out of the blue said, are you married? So I said, yeah. He said, how long? I said, well, 26 years coming up. He said, well, you must be doing something right. Because sadly, he'd had several marriages that had gone wrong. Opportunity to say, well, actually, marriage involves three people. You, your partner, and the God who made you, if you want it to work. You remember that old Sunday school illustration where you got someone out and they put their hands together and you put a, co- you put a bit of cotton round and you said, break it, and it went, easy. And then you said, okay, let's try again. And then you went round about 10 or 20 times and it's a bit harder, but they broke it. So you got them hands out and you did it about 50 times and they were stuck. And of course, that's how sin works, isn't it? It starts off easy. We, can, we, we, we flirt a bit. And we, we, we play with sin because we know that I can break it any time I want. Think of the story of Samson. If ever you want to know someone who flirted with temptation, think of Samson. And the saddest verse in the Bible, or one of them, when he eventually, you know, having flirted with his hair and ropes and stuff like that, he says, you know, I could go out as before. But he did not know that the Lord had departed. All his strength had gone and he was stuck. And if we don't deal with the warning signs and we end up in the, the wrong situation, we're in a mess. So in conclusion, no wonder the father warns his children, stay away from the adulteress, be it male or female. I love what the message paraphrases verse say, stay out of their neighbourhood. Don't faff about flirting and, and toying with the idea and all that. Stay away from it. Run it, leg it, anything you need to do to escape. And the Bible's clear. Don't cheat on your spouse. If you've got problems, work them through. Work them through. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the warnings of your word and the wisdom of your word. Apply it to our hearts and minds, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our final hymn. We have a God of faithfulness. And although we have committed adultery in a whole host of ways, spiritually speaking, run after river gods, he never forsakes us. He never leads us. Let's sing, great is thy faithfulness.
as a lovely little benediction. It says, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, may guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you.